Lincoln Park Zoo, an imagined wilderness in urban 19th century Chicago. Presentation and research by Brittany Postal. Perhaps more than any other cultural attraction, zoos cannot help but represent nature as a human creation, a product of both imagination and hebrew. In his book, American Zoo, A Sociological Safari, sociologist from the University of Pennsylvania, David Grazian, talks about the cultural and natural divide in American zoos. He found that visitors consider exotic African, Asian, and Australian animals to be more wild than the domesticated U.S. farm animals. However, all zoos caretake for their animals. They are fed, provided with veterinary care, and shelter. So the wildness of animals in the zoo is a cultural construct due to how we perceive the exotic. As a researcher on urban spaces and cities who specializes in culture, Grazian allows us a view into how we currently see animals who are living in tamed environments as the ultimate exotic creature, though they are less wild than some of the street cats in our neighborhoods. I hope you walk away from this presentation wondering why it is that an orca at SeaWorld who is trained to beach itself and open its mouth for an examination is more mysterious to us than a raccoon in our neighborhood dumpster. This presentation is about how we experience our relationship with nature, urban expansion, and spatial relations influencing our view on the exoticism in the wild kingdom. In examining Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago over the 19th century, I wanted to consider what made this area a return to nature for man. What about this extremely constructed environment allowed man to believe he was ensconced within the wild? And how did man interact with nature in this highly constructed environment? To understand this, it was first important to root myself in what Chicago looked like at the time of the Lincoln Park Zoo. Chicago of the late 19th century was experiencing rapid industrialization with the onset of extreme urbanization. The population burgeoned almost overnight, growing from 39,000 in 1852 to almost 300,000 by 1870. In these urban spaces, where man was suddenly in a completely industrialized environment, a lack had been found in the setting. The city began to realize the importance of nature, which resulted in the creation of Lincoln Park. Margaret Diana Hansen, an expert on the Lincoln Park Zoo, found that in 19th century Chicago, quote, Public officials and reformers worried that urban environments would alienate city dwellers from nature, negatively affecting health and culture. In response, cities established new public spaces, all of which would allow residents to reconnect with the natural world. This park was an outdoor attraction made up of botanical gardens, monuments, and even a free public zoo to stroll through. But what would a visitor encounter at the Lincoln Park Zoo, and did it fit with the idea of nature and exoticism in the 19th century? Zoos at this time attempted to create what were known as postage stamp collections, with rare and highly sought after pieces being the most valued. An example of a collectible would be Duchess, the elephant who was purchased from Barnum and Bailey Circus in 1888. Another example of the importance of animals based on human interaction was the act of naming. Duchess was given a name and therefore a star attraction. Everybody who visited knew they wanted to see Duchess the elephant, whom they had read about in the papers, such as the Chicago Star Tribune. Other named animals included Teddy Roosevelt, a lion named by Cy DeVry, who was called Whiskers by his keepers. The bears had names as well, a cinnamon bear named Lamin, a black bear named Idaho, a Russian brown named Count Tolstoy, who was called Bill on a daily basis by park visitors and keepers. A young lioness carried the name of Flora and her mother was named Nellie. Two other lions had been named Ben and Kitty, while the sole jaguar of the zoo bore the name Clipper. The monkeys had names as well. Gentleman Jim was a black Brazilian monkey with fellow primates named Irish and Mr. Thompson. Ben and Bess were two of the sea lions who bore an offspring named Babe. The buffaloes had two members named Molly and Bill. Pete and Jenny were two zebras. There were two Indian antelopes named Billy and Nellie. Pasha was the oldest camel at the zoo. DeVry elaborates that for keepers, the animals were all given pet names. However, this points to the fact that it was the charismatic megafauna who were being named by the incoming celebrities, such as Emma Ames, an opera star. The conjunction of naming by celebrities and the names happening to charismatic megafauna highlights where the public interest was at in the 19th century and how people were interacting with ideas of nature at the zoo. The news article does not focus on the 20 nameless guinea pigs. It talks about bears, lions, and elephants, animals that challenge man's dominion over nature, animals that are viewed as large and imposing, dangerous or exotic, and from other continents. From a census taken in 1899 of the animals at the zoo by the Lincoln Park Commission, it is possible to examine what animals held the most interest for the public eye. There are very few reptiles at the zoo, with birds outnumbering mammals. 
However, the variation of species of mammals outnumbers the bird species with the total number of different species for mammals being 44. If the idea was to have a posted postage stamp collection, the variation on these slides illustrates the success of the zoo in completing their collection. The zoo also placed emphasis on the ability of man to continue to interact as the dominant member in the hierarchy of God's kingdom. Camel rides sold at the zoo are an example of offering dominion over an exotic animal and offered the zoo an alternative form of income, turning a wild animal into a domesticated animal and warping the wild into domesticated through a North American perspective. The Lincoln Park Zoo offered people a chance to leave their dense city surroundings and escape to nature, but the zoo was a man's knockoff of nature. This relates to an idea we touched upon in class, the idea of imagined wilderness brought forth by William Cronin in Nature's Metropolis, Chicago and the Great West. Cronin speaks to his own personal experience growing up in the Midwest and passing into the city boundaries of Chicago. He recalls in particular, quote, one smokestack with dense rusty orange vapor rising like a solid column far into the sky before it dissipated. He compares this constructed, overly developed environment to his alive, wild, naturally bursting world of Madison, Wisconsin. The beauty of the, quote, fields of fresh corn and stench of fresh manure, the great fence line bird goals, recalling long vanished prairies of dark lakes and woodlands. But Cronin causes us to wonder why this, <clears throat> why is this the nature of his why is this nature of his Madison any less constructed than the gray streets of Chicago, where in this vast green landscape, heavily touched by the human hand, was their undisturbed nature? The zoo had cages that were built to please the patrons, with unobstructed 365 degree views where animals could not escape from sight. People wanted to escape from the constant scrutiny of living in the city and flocked to the zoo for privacy within nature, and yet they had created a constructed environment so false that it mimicked their own, with animals unable to escape into a natural environment. A prime example of this was the bear pit. The bear pit <clears throat> allowed man literally to look down upon a cage bear that he had dominated. The pit was created so that people could stroll above the bear habitat. The result was people threw coins and popcorn to or at the bears. The height differentials and construction of environment showed man that he had conquered his final foe in nature and that North America was his continent now. He had caged the bear and nothing stood between him and progress as an American. Side to rise, perhaps, perhaps the best example of this fight of man dominating nature. Sai was hired as a zoo handler. He quickly rose to become the zoo director and his tenure at the zoo was a wild ride. In this photograph, you can see Sai feeding a baby collared peccary. He has taken over feeding when a mother has given up on it because he refuses to lose the profit and the opportunity housed within that one animal. He won't allow nature to take its role and he will make sure that baby remains to grow into a profit for the zoo. The next article speaks for itself. Sai was renowned for fighting with bears and lions, with whips and sometimes his fists. In the article from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch of 1901, DeVry is described as entering a lion's cage with, quote, only a whip, and that the ensuing fight was thrilling. Sai, of course, was the victor, and he, quote, took the beast by the tail and put him in a shipping box. The language of the article describes DeVry subjugating the beast. These beasts were three baby leopards, three baby lions, and one full-grown lion. The group was unable to ship three other full-grown lions and were relying upon the arrival of an expert, one Captain Lawrence, who was a known lion man in order to conquer them all. All of this language of this article suggests that animals were forcibly conquered and overpowered. The exact attitude is apparent in the, is apparent in the final slide, where Sai is literally force-feeding a python. He had constructed a food gun, had loaded it, and shot food down the python's throat when it had refused to eat. The python is restrained by other zookeepers. All of these combined factors of man's domination over nature, interaction with the exotic in a manufactured environment, and spatial planning combined to create a mirage of wilderness into which man could escape. It was built based upon public interaction and what people viewed as the exotic. These views were influenced by events of the late 19th century, one of which was the 1893 Columbian Exposition, showcased in the United States to show off Chicago specifically as a city of the future, a leader in science, innovation, and technology. 
the emergence of skyscrapers and man's ability to reverse engineer a river so that he could drink clean water was one of these innovations. Even more broadly in the 19th century as a whole, large happenings were influencing man's view of nature. There was Charles Darwin's origin of species, the founding of the American Museum of Natural History, the beginning of the American conservation movement, and Theodore Roosevelt emerging to support American zoos as a place of education. The creation of Lincoln Park in the 1860s onward was to counteract the loss of nature as well as to create a natural attraction that people wanted to visit. The last of the West was conquered in this era, which meant the realization of manifest destiny. In order to accomplish this, a campaign of genocide was waged against Native Americans. This was taken on in different avenues, but one that concerns the Lincoln Park Zoo is the slaughter of American bison. This became popular as the last rails to the West were finished. Leland Stanford sent out a telegraph at 3.05 p.m. on May 10, 1869, that the Union Pacific Railroad line had been completed. From Stanford's Union Rail, people could leisurely hunt, firing upon buffalo from the comfort of their car as they bore through the plains towards the west. Never before had the continent been so opened, so connected, and so constructed. The U.S. had hit their western border and found themselves without internal land to colonize. The end of the 19th and into the emergent 20th century would turn their gaze towards international imperialism. And this too was reflected in exhibits of the zoo. Furthermore, the emergence of the zoo was the emergence of America on the international front. It grew from an internally colonial nation to an imperialistic nation. Margaret Diana Hansen, who wrote her master's thesis, Munchausen's Side to Rye, Masculinity and Celebrity at Chicago's Lincoln Park Zoo, with a focus on the Lincoln Park Zoo while considering the aspect of celebrity and public eye, described zoos as a way of, quote, studying and caging animals from colonized regions that allowed reinforced ideas of imperialism and authority. She was an expert on the Lincoln Park Zoo during the time of DeBry. She was speaking from a place of the same area of study and the same animals and enclosures which were covered in this study. In her observations, she found imperialism was significant in the displays within the Lincoln Park Zoo. Hansen found several studies that affirmed this, including the one by Sally Gregory Colstead, a professor at University of Michigan, who was awarded the Sarton Award for her scholarly work in the field of history of science. Colstead wrote, studying and caging animals from colonized regions, zoos, reinforced ideas of imperialism and authority. The battle, for na but the battle over nature was a fight for a westernized ideal of civilization. And this was represented by the map of colonized countries animals who were represented at zoos all across America. As David Grazian says in Where the Wild Things Aren't, the fabrication of the idealized natural world is always a complicated proposition, especially for zoos. The Lincoln Park Zoo of the 19th century Chicago was as constructed and unnatural as every other industrial part of Chicago and yet experienced as nature. This presentation has been an attempt in showing why that narrative existed. The public's experience of the exotic was a story of innovation, of spatial planning, and thematic dominance of man over nature. Man designed and trained nature to grow in ways that were aesthetically pleasing, a model of an Eden that never was. Thank you.